Good afternoon, everyone. Perhaps we start. It's 2 p.m. and I know it's very late where Mr. Fry is at the moment, so we should start if, uh, if you all agree. Um, welcome to this webinar organized by the Global Protection Cluster Human Rights Engagement Task Team. My name is uh, Roberta Serentina and I will be your moderator today. I'm here with the co-chairs of the Human Rights Engagement Task Team. Hi, Zaya Torotic from the World Lutheran Federation, and the other co-chair is Elisa Gazzotti from Soga Gaka International. Before starting, let me share a few housekeeping rules. This webinar is recorded and will be uploaded in the Global Protection Cluster YouTube channel. I kindly ask you to mute your microphone throughout the whole event. You can use the chat as you're doing already to share ideas, reactions, comments and questions. And during the Q&A Q section, you will also be able to raise your hand and ask a question or share your views and suggestions. Now let's start. Displacement in a time of changing climate, as the title says. Climate change is already impacting the places where we work and the communities we support. It is exacerbating the vulnerabilities of people who were already displaced, but also at the extreme climate events are displacing more people across the globe. As protection actors, we must see ourselves at the front and at the center of understanding how climate change and disasters are shaping the way we work, the communities that we support, and the responses needed to strengthen rights and advance the solutions in accordance with international law. Today we have the honor with that with us, Mr. Jan Fry, the first special rapporteur on the promotion and protection of human rights in the context of climate change. He was appointed by the Human Rights Council at its 49th session in March 2022 and started his mandate on the 1st of May. We will hear about the role of his mandate, his vision and possibilities to engage with his newly established human rights mechanism. We, we also had the pleasure to have with us Mr. Andrew Harper, Special Advisor on Climate Action at UNHCR, who will give us some opening remarks. After, we would like to hear from Protection Cluster coordina Coordinators and the wider protection community that is with us today about the consequences of climate change on displaced communities, the increased need for protection and the challenges faced. Without further ado, Mr. Harper, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Roberta, and nice to uh, see you, Ian. Um, I think like, I won't be going on for too long because I think it's super important to actually be listening to the people who are on online today. But I would just like to say how important it is to have somebody not just filling the role of the Special Rapporteur on Human Rights and Climate Change, but to have somebody like Ian, because we, we need somebody who is um, not necessarily from the system um, who is not so bureaucratic and who is can see what's actually happening on the ground and who can represent the human face of climate change. But I think this is the big challenge for all of us is to bring the voices of people who are being impacted to the fore and to the, the policy makers and to the decision makers to make those changes. Why UNHCR is so much engaged in this is because um, while there is no such thing as a climate refugee in, in, uh, in technical terms, um, there's no doubt that climate change and disasters are impacting um, the displacement of tens of millions of people. And even in the last couple of years, we've been looking at almost one displacement per second. And if you look at trends and you say, OK, is it likely to increase or decrease? It's obviously going to increase because that the world is not uh, mitigating the emissions, we're not supporting adaptation or preparedness, we're not addressing loss and damage. And so as a consequence, unfortunately, human rights situation of tens of millions of people are going to be impacted neg negatively. So we have to do whatever we can to amplify the voices of those people being impacted, uh, work with communities to see how we can provide the best pragmatic support to them not necessarily looking at multilateral changes or instruments, but look at what does what does pragmatic human rights mean to those people on the ground? As I, as I was mentioning, like ninety percent of the world's refugees originate from countries which are already being impacted by the climate emergency and have got the least capacity to adapt. And it's a similar number as far as internally displaced. So 
we're, we're all very we're already very much on the front lines of, of the um, of the climate emergency so we need to be looking at what are the human right human rights consequences for affected populations and what can we be looking to do to anticipate where these pressures will be coming to in the future and why it's so important to be um, listening and to be part of, of today's session is that the the people who are on the line today are the ones who are most knowledgeable and have the best linkages to those populations, whether it be in Somalia or the Eastern Horn of Africa or Latin America or South Asia or the small island developing states or, incre or increasingly in developed countries, there's no, there's no population which will not be impacted. But our role is to certainly support and address those people who are most vulnerable of the vulnerable. And certainly from UNHCR's perspective, uh, that's those people who have already been displaced by conflict because they often lack the uh, capacity or um, they don't have the resources to adapt, nor do their host communities. So super, super enthused to be part of today's session. Look forward to listening um, and most importantly, learning uh, from each and every one of you. Thank you, Roberta. Over. Thank you so much, uh, Andrew. Uh, and I will pass the floor to the human face of climate change, Mr. Jan Fry, who will tell us about his mandate, um, his vision, his um, up upcoming missions and re reports, but also, as Andrew was saying, how we can pragmatically speak about human rights to those who are affected and how we can amplify their voices. This is very important. And as you know, protection cluster and protection, the protection community has a very wide reach, uh, especially in those countries that are already affected by humanitarian crisis. And therefore, we, we play an important role, as Andrew was saying, in amplifying their voices and make, making sure from our side as protection actors that their concern are challenged to their special rapporteur. So without further ado, uh, Mr. Jan Fry, I will give you the floor and we are very happy to have you here and to hear from you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you very much, Roberta, and uh, thank you, Andrew. Just to give you a quick background about myself, uh, before taking on this jo job as Special Rapporteur, I work for the Tuvalu government, a small Pacific Island country, which is really at the forefront of climate change impacts. The highest point above sea level for the entire country is only four metres. So I've, I've been actively in engaged with climate change negotiations for many years, uh, you know, representing the government of Tuvalu at those meetings. So taking on this role as special rapporteur, uh, I, I was the mandate that was created for me last year is quite broad. It, it covers pretty much, you know, to look at all issues uh, associated with human rights and climate change, uh, and and to reflect upon those, and, and particularly, you know, looking at people in vulnerable situations uh, as a consequence of climate change. So I I, I presented uh, my first report to the Human Rights Council um, in June this year, and basically gave an overview of the thematic areas that I want to to look at. So I identified six key thematic areas, and I'll quickly run through those uh, because not all of them are sort of relevant to your work, but it, it's useful to consider these in, in context. So the first thematic area, uh, which I will be reporting to the UN General Assembly in October, relates to the sort of functionality of, of cl uh, climate change issues, and, and that's primarily looking at mitigation. So that's you know, what what actions uh, are, you know, the lack of action on reducing emissions and how that's having an impact on climate change. Looking particularly at the issue of loss and damage. So this is the costs and damage that people are suffering as a consequence of climate change. And then finally, looking at sort of participation issues, uh, particularly around, uh, you know, uh, climate rights holders, uh, and their participation in the debate around these issues on climate change and also around human rights defenders and and particularly Indigenous peoples uh, associated with defending their rights uh, as a consequence of climate change. So that's the first one. The second one is probably uh, the most connected to your to your uh, mandates and, and issues is looking at climate change displacement. And I'll, I'll go into a bit more detail about that in a moment. 
The third one is looking at sort of climate change legislation, litigation. Uh, so this is looking at where governments have implemented climate change legislation and seeing whether they're, they've put a, a human rights aspect into that legislation. Uh, certainly, there are, we are seeing a number of cases coming up on l climate change litigation uh, uh, against companies, ag against countries. There are youth groups doing that sort of work. So I, I, I'll be looking at that, seeing where, uh, how I can contribute to that sort of role. And I'm particularly interested in, in this issue of intergenerational justice. So it's giving protection uh, to future generations uh, in, in, in legal systems that we have now, and also looking at the issue of access to courts. Uh, we know that there are various youth groups that who have participated in some court systems. Some have been able to get access to courts, some haven't. So we're, I'm, I'm going to be looking at that as, a, as an issue as well. The next one is the responsibility of business uh, and its uh, responsibility as far as uh, human rights and climate change, particularly around the issue of disclosure. Uh, you know, where are companies investing their money? Are they investing it in fossil fuels um, and so forth? And, and trying to tease out where, where those sort of technologies apply. Uh, you know where 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 their investments apply, and and seeing whether we can, you know, uh, bring bring that to the fore. Particularly, you know, there are a lot of financial ins institutions like uh, pension funds, superannuation funds that are investing in fossil fuel industries. The next one looks at just transition. So this is primarily looking at people who may be employed in the fossil fuel industry, uh, who uh, as, as countries uh, and communities move towards a more green economy, uh, can we give a proper human rights protection to the people who, who will be transforming to this green economies uh, to make sure that nobody is left behind? So that's workers in the fossil fuel industry, their families, their communities, how do we give protection to them and make sure that they're part of this transition to a green economy? And finally, I'm going to be looking at new technologies. And this uh, this is interesting area where, where the, there's a view that, you know, under our current scenarios in climate change, we're not going to stabilise at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so there are proposals for rather drastic measures uh, to, to deal with the, the, the heating of the atmosphere. And th these are, you know, sort of broadly come under the definition of geoengineering. So this is uh, atmospheric injection, uh, cloud brightening, and, and various sorts of uh, meteorological changes that could be take place. And of course, th there will be winners and losers in that sort of technology. Uh, and so I want to look at the human rights aspects of that. So they're, they're the six six broad areas that I've been looking at. And, and to come back to the one that's most relevant is the issue of climate change displacement. And one of the issues that uh, that has come out in, 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 you know, preliminary looking at this is that, you know, as Andrew indicated, there are people displaced across international borders as a consequence of climate change. We know that's happening already. Uh, and, and those people are not defined as refugees under the UN Refugee Convention. Um, and therefore they fall through the cracks with legal protection. And that was revealed in a case where um, a Kiribati couple uh, went to New Zealand and sought refuge, climate change refugee status uh, in a court that is known as the Teteota Court case, and they were denied climate change uh, refugee status because there is no such thing. So I, I'm, I want to look at this sort of the, these sort of legal aspects of, of people displaced, internally displaced, and uh, across international borders, what sort of level of protection is given to those people? And we know that there are uh, the Kampala guidelines for, for dealing with internally displaced people, but they're just guidelines. So I want to see how well those guidelines are being implemented, if at all, and what sort of 
you know, are countries developing national legislation to implement those guidelines? And then what is needed to, you know, legally give protection to people displaced across international borders? So I, uh, we, we've just recently employed a consultant to look at that, who's a lawyer from Mexico, uh, and and she's going to be looking at some of these legal issues. And we're, we've given her a series of sort of questions to ask about legal protections. We know there's the Nansen Initiative, which was a which was a sort of looking at uh, migration and displacement issues. Again, these are only guidelines. Uh, and they're not legally binding. So the, these are sort of the questions that I, I want to look at is how, how can we enshrine, you know, human rights protections for people who are displaced as a consequence of climate change? And a, as we know, there are people clearly being displaced uh, as a consequence of climate change. So yeah, it would be very helpful, you know, in part of what I'm doing is is to connect with you. You're the people on the ground. You're seeing what's going on in the on the ground and and to get any sort of case studies from you about, uh, you know, uh, identifying people that are um, displaced as a consequence of climate change. But this also links to this issue of loss and damage that I'm looking at. Uh, you know, we, we know that people are suffering, uh, you know, huge costs as a consequence of climate change from flat floods, from droughts, uh, from various impacts that and they are suffering enormous losses. And, and there was a recent, uh, you know, there's been recent estimates by Oxfam around the costs of the impacts of uh, climate change on various communities. So is there a way of finding the, the right form of protect, you know, to give compensation to people uh, who are, you know, affected by climate change. And clearly, you know, we've got to look at, are there sort of certain compensation measures for people who are displaced as well? And what initiatives could be developed? Of course, there's also the issue of adaptation. You know, can we on the ground prevent, develop, adaptation measures to prevent people from being displaced. And certainly, again, you know, you're the people on the ground who can, uh, you know, are aware of those sorts of initiatives. And I, I'd, I'd certainly want, want to uh, to know about those, I guess, and, and, you know, exchange ideas and views about those sorts of initiatives. I will be take, doing some country visits as part of my work. Um, I'm currently uh, negotiating to go to Bangladesh. Uh, I, I, I've just been well. We've I've been working on going there in September, but that may not happen. Um, but certainly, we'll be going to Bangladesh uh, at some stage this year. I, I'm looking at sort of wanting to look at the dry corridor issues in 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 uh, Central America because we know there's a lot of uh, people displaced for a variety of reasons. So obviously, um, you know, there are people there for security reasons, but there clearly are people displaced uh, across borders as a consequence of climate change. And I had a recent call for submissions around the loss and damage, and we heard you know, we got submissions from people from NGOs in Latin America saying, you know, people are clearly being displaced as a consequence of climate change. So we, you know, I I, I would certainly want to reach out to you that there, there's clearly two aspects of this. You know, people are displaced by, you know, severe events that are happening now. So that's floods. But there's also the issue of what we call slow onset events. Uh, and no doubt you're aware of those issues of the slow climatic changes that 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 are driving people away from their from their land. So this is droughts. Though droughts can happen quickly, but the slow progressive droughts are one of those. Sea level rise is another. Uh, that that's a critical issue that uh, I want to be looking at. So we've got this, you know, uh, rapid displacement of people, and then we've got what we call slow onset events as well, and and the consequences of those are quite significant. So that that's where I stand in in this issue, and I I certainly want you know if you are aware of these sorts of events going on, you know if there's any way that I can help and and collaborate, 
uh, put out communications about circumstances that you're aware of that might help uh, you know, present the circumstances that you're aware of uh, to the international community. I, I'm more than happy to help out, you know, through through various forms of communications. So, um, if if there's any way that I I can help with what you're doing on the ground, I, I'm more than happy to to collaborate there. So that's just a sort of very quick overview of where I'm at at this moment and uh, more than happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fry, uh, for this very interesting overview of your mandate and upcoming activities. I would like now to uh, to open the floor to all uh, protection cluster coordinators that are connected and the wider uh, protection community. Uh, perhaps we could start with the protection cluster co-coordinator uh, in Ethiopia, Alon, to come in, um, and he could uh, he could tell you about the challenges that they are facing in Ethiopia, but also the kind of support that they need, as you were asking, Mr. Fry, because this is an excellent opportunity to to exchange on how we can better support your work, and on the other hand, how you can also better support our work and strengthen the protection of those who are most affected. So, uh, Alon, are you online? If you want to come in, please come in. Yes, th thank you, Roberta. And thank you, uh, Mr. Fry, as well. Um, I think it was interesting to hear this, uh, I would say, um, government-focused approach and an approach that obviously focused on the government uh, responsibility to protect and to, uh, to provide access to essential services, but I think uh, uh, most of the clusters here will, will obviously, we know more about the humanitarian response, about the response of the humanitarian community. And um, in most cases, at least in Ethiopia, obviously, I mean, we do have an issue and a challenge, an ongoing challenge to actually mobilize um, the government, uh, you know, to kind of like uh, fulfill its obligations. Uh, especially uh, in the context of, of climate change. And for instance, in Ethiopia, I mean, we have now, um, I would say, four consecutive failing uh, seasons of, of rain. Um, so nothing in a way, it's, it's not predictable, but at the end, and it's not in, it's, it's not in any way a failed uh, state. Um, but the situation is considered as an emergency as a situation that is um, to be solved or mainly solved by the international community and donors rather than uh, by, by the government, uh, by the government authorities. So with that, maybe just uh, I want to highlight maybe um, a couple of challenges. Um, first, I think there's a challenge of data collection. I mean, you, you we were talking a lot about displacement. So, I mean, displacement, of course, we can maybe monitor better, uh, not, you know, in a perfect way. But when we're talking about protection concerns, mainly uh, negative uh, coping mechanisms, we see an increase in child labor, in, in child marriage, uh, survival sex, um, begging, all this kind of stuff. I mean, we really have a, um, while all of these coping mechanisms are observed, we actually don't really, we cannot really say something about an increase because we don't necessarily have the baseline and we don't necessarily um, collect this um, um, data on a regular basis. Um, another issue is intercommunal violence, uh, you know, because of competition over resources. This is maybe something that we can do a, um, a little better in terms of, of noticing these trends. But as a whole, um, data collection is a challenge. Another challenge is for us, what exactly is the added value of protection? Um, and I'm talking maybe not about the whole, I would say, range of human rights, but more about um, exposure to violence, to exploitation, to neglect. I mean, it, if other sectors are already providing assistance, such as health, food, nutrition, water, what is the exact what is the exact added value of of the protection cluster? 
Um, um, and maybe the third one, and you mentioned also the, the combination of climate change and conflict, and this goes back to the government responsibility, how we really reconcile um, the response with humanitarian principles when the government, for instance, does not give us access um, to conflict areas or try to dictate to us, okay, you can respond here and obviously, you know, spend a lot of money in drought affected areas, but you cannot do the same in conflict areas, uh, affected areas. So I think for us, it's also a dilemma, um, you know, how we can really um, work together with government and together with other partners, for instance, development partners uh, in drought affected areas, but do not, I would say, uh, overlooked conflict affected areas. Notice that in many cases, you know, some areas are, are affected both by conflict and uh, climate uh, change and, and the displacement, uh, the result of displacement. So um, thanks for this. Thank you so much, uh, Alan. Perhaps uh, we can we can ask uh, Sabrina, Protection Cluster Coordinator in Mali, to come in, and then we can let the Special Rapporteur reply to this first round of questions and comments, and then we can keep gathering other questions and views. Uh, Sabrina, uh, you have the floor. Thank you Thanks, so much Roberta. for joining. Good, good afternoon, Mr. Mr. Frey. Um, so in Mali, it's quite complicated, especially these days, because it, the, the Malian crisis, it's a bit like uh, the soci sociological question of the chicken and egg. So um, as you know, Mali is, is really like, uh, we, we talk a lot about multidimensional crisis, uh, because we have indeed all these uh, question of um, of uh, climate that are frequently um, coming up uh, on the table because we have like a lot of displacement um, connected to um, um, to drought, but also um, to flooding, etc. Um, I mean, listening to uh, to to Mr. Fry, it was indeed quite interesting to see um, how we we need to. Um, uh, to to approach this question with government, but I think it's like really um, uh, for us what we see like in Mali, it's how we can better approach it, like but uh, from both sides with community uh, in order to um, to better impact the changes um, of behaviors, etc. But indeed, also we need. They, they, there are a lot of work uh, that need to be done um, uh, from legal uh, point of view in Mali, etc., where um, uh, this question of um, uh, of climate change is uh, often uh, coming uh, in the discussions with the government, etc. But it's quite difficult to um, to see how we can have it in more operational way to to make it like more concrete. Uh, how we should translate it to try to mitigate um, the the current situation. So um, in Mali, um, the um, we have historically um, the the question of um, of um, climate, etc. It's uh, very present because. Um, all the activities, the main livelihood activities, um, are depending on um, on uh, land. On, uh, I mean, the, the 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 main activities are agriculture and livestock, so uh, they are complete completely depending on uh, climatic conditions, and we know also that uh, these activities are, are frequently fragilized by climate change. Um, now. Um, since the crisis uh, we are facing uh, now since 10 years, um, it's also increasing because um, we know that uh, we don't have necessarily uh, control on uh, on the the forced displacement of uh, 
of uh, the, the various communities um, across the countries. But what we have is um, uh, more and more pressure on um, some uh, sources, but also pressure on land, etc. And in Mali, uh, it's uh, quite complicated because historically there is already uh, an issue uh, on uh, land and property. So, uh, so, so the the conflict is really coming and crystallizing a bit uh, all these uh, tensions. Um, we what we what we can see so it was interesting to hear from uh, the colleague in ethiopia that the, we don't have like clear data on how the situation is completely is impacting directly on um, on people but what we see is for example like Last um, last April, the nutrition cluster uh, released an advocacy note showing uh, that there is around 1.2 million individuals who were facing a food crisis. And um, it was also interesting to see that there is a clear increase with um, around like 70% of our women um, and 70% of, um, of these women um, were mainly a household. So um, the, the region that are impacted are also the, the region that are really under stress because of uh, climate uh, change, like the Liptako Gourma, uh, which is one of the most um, affected um, uh, area um, by the conflict, but also the center um, where the situation um, is also deteriorating and the north um, close to Timbuktu and uh, Ngao. Um, when we discuss with the communities, they, they clearly said that because they don't, they are not able to to have any food stock because they are not able to um, uh, to to harvest properly, etc. Um, they are obliged also to develop like a coping mechanism. And if we discuss like, for example, with um, the different um, AOR, like uh, child protection or GBV, what we see is because of this um, movement um, of, uh, of population that we have uh, after uh, natural disasters, um, there is potentially a connection with like um, uh, an increase of uh, situation of coping mechanism in some areas, for example, in Gao, strangely, where we had when we had like an increase of uh, forced displacement after some flooding, after a few months, we we could um, see an increase of um, forced prostitution uh, in the different areas of Gao. We have also an increase of uh, forced recruitment in our group where even if the um, if the children when they are interviewed are not clearly saying it's because of um, uh, of the the lack of uh, harvest etc they were obliged to move um, what we see is um, the, the the common response they are providing we need uh, to sustain the need of our family because we are not able to have like our traditional activities um, uh, it can be uh, for for pastoral activities or uh, for ag agricultural activities so basically even if we are not monitoring um, um, specifically the linkage between um, like the climate impact and the consequences on um, on uh, affected communities we can see that there is a clear trend and I think it's also for this reason that um, the um, humanitarian coordinator asked us a few months ago also to um, to try to provide like more information on impact um, of uh, climate changes and peace and security in Mali and also uh, what are the actions that we are building currently um, to to mitigate uh, the situation the problem is like uh, as humanitarian, we are also facing a lot of uh, challenges uh, in the sense that 
um, indeed, we have like more uh, project and so social cohesion built around how the community can better manage the water sources uh, to prevent tension, or also uh, how to better sensitize girls and boys on the risk of cl climate change, training on prevention of uh, natural disasters, etc. But I think um, if we want really to to have like um, uh, a more serious impact, especially in a context like the Sahel in general. Um, uh, we need uh, to, to approach it on a more programmatic way, in addition also uh, to, to have like more uh, structured and, and maybe more uh, focused uh, discussion with the government on uh, how this should be systematically integrated, for example, um, in uh, in all the the, the policy uh, that are in place, but also we have like discussions on the durable solutions and uh, and um, the law on protection of displaced uh, persons. So it's something that we should also integrate uh, as well. So I don't know if uh, there is any question. Thank you so much, Sabrina. And perhaps I will let the special rapporteur reply. I think there were some uh, um, common issues uh, mentioned by both Alan and, and Sabrina, the rise of uh, negative coping mechanisms and, uh, and the lack of a programmatic approach of, of climate change. Um, Mr. Fry, and there was also a very important question that was asking Alan actually, what's the role of the protection actors when we know that SGBV have a responsibility, they have a specific role and they will have specific activities and all the other AURs, uh, they will have also a role to play, but when it comes to the wider protection community, what would be the role? As Alan was asking, and I think this is also a good occasion to, uh, to stress the importance of for protection actors to 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 fill the gap and, and promote the human rights of affected communities, but I, I will let you speak uh, more about uh, the human rights consequences of climate change, or what you suggest to do in, in the two contexts that were uh, mentioned. Thank you. Thank you very much, and 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 thank you, Alan and Sabrina, for for uh, giving those sort of uh, very good examples of of the situation. Uh, I, I I do admit that you know my focus is primarily looking at sort of legislative uh, changes that governments can employ, but it clearly, uh, you know, if there are other approaches, uh, how, how to effectively mobilise the humanitarian response. You know, as we know that, you know, it, it's humanitarian response it can be very ad hoc in, in, in its approach. You know, it, it identifies an issue, money is thrown at it, and then, you know, uh, money moves away somewhere else and and is is there a more a systematic approach to deal with with these with these issues and 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 particularly sort of this sort of connects with the loss and damage aspect is 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 there does there need to be a whole new pool of finance supporting uh, loss and damage as a consequence of climate change and are there innovative sources of finance that are connected to the the greenhouse gas producers, I guess. So this is, you know, looking at levies on aviation, uh, maritime transport, th these sorts of new ways of gaining finance rather than just relying on, on you, know, you know, humanitarian finance uh, from, from, uh, from, from various humanitarian organisations and from governments and look at alternative sources of funding. Um, the issue of challenge of data collection is... is is uh, is a, a real challenge, and and you know getting the the evidence you know to present to uh, you know that that these are issues uh, is is critical, and if there are any ways that we can uh, you know my mandate can help in in sort of trying to support data collection, uh, please let me know. I clearly there are connections uh, as both uh, Alan and Sabrina has indicated. Uh, of consequences of climate change and 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 subsequent human rights impacts and the the special rapporteur on violence against women is is also looking at this issue of climate change because we know uh, you know there are situations where because women have to walk longer distances to collect water 
uh, and and are displaced from the, their own territories, or that because of loss of income, uh, their their husbands have to move to cities and therefore they're left in isolated situations. That they, they, they are put in situations where uh, you know they're they're subject to uh, harassment and violence, um, and and as as indicated, you know. Uh, forced into situations of prostitution as alternative incomes and you know as, as um, and you know children being put into situations where they have to uh, uh, you know be f forced into uh, in, into armed groups so there, there are a whole lot of complexities here and and you know teasing out those and identifying which ones are climate change related uh, is a challenge but but I think we're starting to get a clearer picture of of clearly the impacts of climate change. Even looking at the nutritional ones, the, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is saying that a warmer and more CO2 in the atmosphere makes plants grow quicker because plants grow on carbon dioxide. But what, what the effect it's having is that, that a faster growing plants are, are not picking up the same nutrients that's slower growing plants. And this, this is going to have an impact on nutrition, particularly for grain crops. So that there's, you know, another sort of consequence there, not only because of these, the of droughts and circumstances like that, but just, you know, the fact that there is increased CO2 in the atmosphere is, will have an effect on the nutritional value of grain crops. And there's been studies to look at that uh, and its effect in, in Africa. So, you know, uh, is there a need for a more programmatic approach to this? Uh, clearly, there has to be. But of course, you know, we're dealing with least developed countries who, whose governments don't have the resources to, to, to deal with those issues. And, you know, I've, you know, worked as part of my work with Tuvalu with the least developed countries in climate change negotiations, you know, and that includes Mali and Ethiopia and all these countries. So, you know, the, these are the challenges these countries have. Is, is what I'm trying to sort of draw attention to is the fact that the impacts uh, of the, on, these, on the populations is not of the making of those countries. The impacts are coming from outside. Uh, through the major industrialised countries. So there is a responsibility by those major industrialised countries to assist those, the countries to help on the ground. And finally, just this connection between the sort of security issues, climate change, um, <clears throat> and this, this has been you know, picked up previously in the Security Council. I know the German government um, brought on some work on uh, looking at the Sahel region and got a resolution out of the Security Council. I recently had a meeting with the ambassador from, uh, um, uh, where was it? Uh, I, I'll think of it in a moment. But um, basically the the Security, Count, Security Council looks like they'll pick up again on some of these climate change issues. So the, these are, you know, again, these sorts of challenges that, uh, sorry, it was Malta, the ambassador from Malta, and he, and they've just become non-permanent representatives on the Security Council. So they, they want to have a look at this issue in particular. So, you know, uh, there are lots of complex issues uh, to work through, I guess, and we're just trying to find, you know, the connections that, uh, that, you know, can, uh, you know, get the experience that you have on the ground and bring them to the international community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fry. First of all, for highlighting the gender dimension of climate change, which is also very important. And then also for stressing that indeed the countries who are most affected by the consequences of climate change are those who actually contributed the least to, to climate change. Um, I saw that there were some questions in the chat but first of all I want to ask if someone wants to come in and raise their hand um, yes uh, Bazema please come in thank you um, yes good afternoon um, uh, thank you very much for for this 
insightful um, presentation. Um, in the, um, I am Basemi Kulimushi, I'm the Senior Operations Coordinator uh, in the Regional Bureau UNHCR Nairobi. And um, first of all, this is uh, the, the topic that you just um, introduced uh, on justice or climate justice is, is very, uh, very good. I think it is really uh, pushing in the right direction. Um, Andrew has been educating us on the issue of climate change and climate action, and we are very much um, appreciative of all the insights that have been shared so far. And I think this specific one is, is, uh, is very important. First of all, the, one of the challenges now that I would like to highlight here is that this issue of climate justice as it might, as it, as it will, or it does refer to uh, persons of concern to UNHCR is going to be even more complex than the issues related to um, conflict. Um, because when we talk about persons of concern as a result of conflict, we, we can we can very much make a difference between the local citizens, the local residents, and anyone who has crossed the border and who is in that space as a result of the conflict and the fear of uh, for their lives uh, in their countries. Now, this situation is going to be even more complex because you cannot even distinguish uh, if uh, as if uh, persons of concern have lost uh, their 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 food stocks because of floods, they've lost their their their, their livestock or uh, livelihoods because of floods, for example, or they have no food to eat because of drought. Uh, the issue of not only of persons of concern is important here, but also the host communities because they will be equally affected. And any assistance to what uh, we refer to as persons of concern, if that assistance is not extended to the host community, that is affecting the protection space. It's going to affect the peaceful co coexistence uh, it's going to affect the attitude, not only of the population, but also even the government itself. So from that perspective, it's, it's really going to be uh, very tough. So now the, the element of justice is, is, uh, is also equally important in the sense that uh, I think you, it, it, um, it, it sort of touches on the element or the notion of externalities. Uh, developing countries where we have most of our work done, uh, where we have most of the persons of concern, whether they are suffering because of the effect of drought or because of the effects of, of floods and other climate related hazards, they are suffering because of externalities of production appetites, production ways, and you mentioned the appetite for fossil fuel, uh, fossil uh, fuel, for example. This is a, as a result of behaviors and the economic mindset of industrialized uh, countries. So now this element of justice should really focus on the element of externality and also for the donors to prioritize. Because there are another challenges for donors to act to, uh, to prioritize um, donorship or um, their funding to not only address effects of war and conflict, but also the effect of climate change. Uh, and I think for the time being, as to, uh, to the extent to which we are being educated, 
I think donors are likewise probably also need to be educated to see things from that perspective. Uh, governments, the, the reference was made to, to governments. I think this is also an area where governments likewise need to be su further supported. Further supported um, in the sense that I think there is still need for a lot of diplomacy in the, cons in the area of awareness raising. Because generally when we when we when we have issues such as drought, such as floods and things like that, uh, yes, we see the effects with the with the effects and we tend to rush to to look at how to address the symptoms to distribute food, distribute blankets and so on. But I think uh, awareness raising has to be also done in the direction of causes, what I what is causing this effect in your country? And what your can your government do to prevent this from happening in the future? Because we can distribute food today, but if the land has been degraded, that would not solve the problem. And it's even more acute than conflict really, because I think when, when we talk about conflict, we sometimes we think about repatriation because once this situation has improved back home, we can send uh, the, the refugees back home. But in this situation, if it is because um, of deforestation, because of land degradation, because of temperature rising, as an, this is not going to be something that is going to, to stop. So people need a new way of living, a new space to live. And here may be issues like uh, uh, agriculture, smart agriculture is going to be maybe the solutions. So it's looking at the causes, educating government donors on the causes, but also on what needs to be done so that to now uh, immediately and also in the long term, which also hinges on the intergenerational justice that uh, that you, you you mentioned and the issues of technology and things like that so these are some of the ideas that i would like to share uh, with you here thank you uh, hello i can't i can't hear you sorry sorry i was muted Yes, and I was saying, uh, Mr. Fry, do you want to reply now or shall we collect two more questions perhaps and then uh, you will reply? What, what do you prefer? Uh, I'll just a quick response to Barsemi because he's made some very good points. Uh, uh, obviously, sure. you're aware of the situation in, in Somalia and people displaced across and, and the point about, you know, the, the, the recipient country, uh, you know, and how to give, you know, proper uh, protections for those countries and and support to those countries is a critical part of the discussion, and I think that's that's important. And, and the issue of externalities, you know, the, the the countries who are responsible for this climate change have to understand their responsibility and and to step up. And and in in currently in climate change negotiations, we're we're getting a lot of denial around that area. And that's certainly one of the issues that I, I want to bring forward is, you know, the responsibility of the producers of greenhouse gases to to these uh, issues that are, are confronting countries now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fry. I will now uh, give the floor to Ryan, Ryan Mitra and then Ursula. Uh, thank you so much. Um, so I'm, I'm from the Norwegian Refugee Council uh, Humanitarian Policy Division in Geneva, and I'm also doing a PhD on climate displacement in the Indo-Pacific. Um, so uh, the NRC recently launched a project on climate crisis displacement and housing, land and property um, as a nexus point between uh, the development and humanitarian sector. So I was wondering whether um, whether your mandate will sort of be looking at, at the nexus of these issues on particular key factors, such as, let's say, 
voluntary and involuntary mobility in the context of climate displacement, tenure and security in forced eviction in um, IDP camps, forced evictions um, through development projects that have adopted a rhetoric of greening and environmental protection. And the last would be in regards to adaptive, adaptive housing practices sort of emerging due to climate change and in the interest of uh, protecting human rights or related to housing, land and property. Thank you so much, Ryan. Uh, uh, Mr. Fry? Yes, thank you. Thank you for those questions. I mean, all of those issues are interconnected and 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 part of the sort of bigger picture that we have to look at. Um, and and critically, you know, one of the issues that we're seeing as well is that people who are uh, displaced and are put in refugee camps are also suffering the impacts of climate change when they're in refugee camps. And we're 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 seeing that with the Rohingya population in Bangladesh who are, have suffered from fl floods. Uh, and uh, and some of the so refugee populations in the Middle East who are suffering from extreme heat exposure, uh, and so that there are that sort of double double issue that they're confronted with. They may be displaced as a consequence of climate change, and when they're put into sort of refugee camps, they're also suffering uh, climate change impacts. So you know there there are some of these other issues around uh, you know voluntary and involuntary. Um, displacement are, are, are part of the issues, you know, and there's discussion about whether migration can be an adaptation strategy or not. Um, and, and certainly there's discussions around that issue as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fry. And there was Ursula who would like to come in. Please, Ursula. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. <clears throat> Just to highlight a, a little bit our context here in Southern Africa region, where we have eight countries most vulnerable to climate change, especially Angola, DRC, Madagascar, Mozambique also. From the data we collected between 2010 and 2019, we estimated an average of 500,000 displacement per year due to climate change and disaster. And in our region, frequent uh, climate-related disaster at drought and high temperature, especially in Madagascar and Mozambique, leading to the loss of crops and livestock, but also severe food crisis, a tropical uh, cyclone in Mozambique, a uh, very recent Malawi and Zimbabwe leading to, this, to the destruction of property, livelihood, and with an increased poverty. I don't know where to put volcano eruption impact in DRC in the discussion, uh, knowing that more than 300,000 uh, uh, people flee their home in Goma and surrounding area, according to Ocha estimate. So here in the region, we have a mix of slow onset disaster and rapid onset disaster also. In terms of way forward, we are considering the following. Uh, working on the perception that population have of climate change, which seems uh, totally inevitable or without solution for communities. So uh, raising awareness is very key, but also engaging uh, states in the implementation of policy dealing with the climate issues. The second uh, uh, way forward is addressing data gaps. You have mentioned uh, several times through the collection of disaggregated data to better understand the impact, but also key protection issues we should address in priority with national authorities and other relevant stakeholders. We are, are thinking also uh, about scaling up adaptation financing and support to climate action in countries and host community areas where displaced people take refuge or hope to safely return to the following, uh, to following their displacement by strengthening preparedness and building resilience to climate impact and uh, 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 as a as a last uh, way forward the cooperation international cooperation with states 
re, but also regional bodies such as SADC here in Southern African region to, to strengthen national legislation and mechanisms to address climate change and natural disaster issues, but also to ensure protection of all those displaced in the context of climate change. And just for your information, we'll jointly organize this week with the Center for Human Rights here in Pretoria, a webinar on climate change inducing displacement with some uh, important uh, speakers uh, from the region and elsewhere. Thank you, over. Thank you so much, Ursula. And now, um, Ugo, the Protection Cluster Coordinator from Mozambique, would like to come in. Ugo. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Roberta. Can, can you hear me? Just making sure. I mean, yes, we great. can hear you. And very nice to meet you, uh, um, Mr. Fry. I'm Hugo Reichenberger, as mentioned by Roberta. I'm the Protection Cluster Coordinator in Mozambique. So I, I come in very nicely after Ursula, who's representing uh, UNHCR at the regional level. So allow me to maybe zoom in a little bit on Mozambique. I think um, everyone remembers uh, the Idai cyclone in 2019, March, right? And, and the incredible destruction that it caused in Mozambique. Um, this was really, you, you know, the, one of the worst cyclones in, in African history, and it really caused, um, you know, devastating impact, um, displacement of half a million people, and it has left um, some 90,000 still displaced in de facto camps until today. But I'm not here necessarily to speak about Idai. I'm here to speak about the story of a country that had in the past seen a cyclone every 15 years, every 10 years, every five years. And now essentially we are seeing cyclones on a yearly basis. And until I had arrived in 2020, we had you know, a, a good strong cyclone a year. But what we saw this year is we, we saw at least three to four cyclones that have caused some sort of displacement, some sort of impact on the on the population living uh, near the coast. And the reason I mentioned displacement is that the protection cluster um, and the whole cluster system, in fact, was born out of the Adai cyclone system, and it kind of remained active or de facto active in Mozambique until today and as you know, has been responding to a conflict in the north, but is also responding, you know, stretching itself and responding to cyclone displacement, mostly happening in the central part of Mozambique, but this year surprising us and hitting also in the northern uh, part of Mozambique. Um, I, I guess what I want to add to what Ursula very well um, explained is that from the Idai cyclone, the national institution dealing with displacement and um, you know the impacts of climate change, INGD, has really um, come a long way um, in Mozambique. It really learned from Idai, it learned from a cyclone called Eloise last year, and it's continuously learning. What, what we observe as a protection cluster, and also my, my units, our colleagues, is that it's a diamond that has to be polished, right? cyclone response is still very much seen as an operational matter, right? Let's move people, let's, let's you know, let's dump food, let's relocate them quickly um, wherever they, we, we believe will be safer for them. But what we've seen is that there's a big lack of, of course, protection mainstreaming, which is a pillar of, of protection clusters uh, work here in Mozambique. And also, of course, involvement and engagement of the community. Um, so we've been working on, on the operational side as a cluster with, um, as you know, the cluster is a is a forum, right, of different partners, different NGO partners. So we are normally the ones on the ground first whenever cyclone hits, visiting evacuation centers, transit centers, doing protection mainstreaming 101, you know, making sure 
basic things such as toilets are separated. There's separate sleeping quarters for men and women. Um, there's lighting in communal areas, very basic stuff, really. But we're also, on the other hand, number two, making sure the INGD can appropriate itself of, of these protection elements in its response, but also understanding this displacement also from a human rights perspective, right? Because at the moment they do a fantastic job and I don't want to be uh, overly critical as uh, protection colleagues normally are, right? But uh, there, there really is that element of protection mainstreaming, protection integration um, that is missing um, in that response. So I, I just wanted to make my intervention very uh, short and um, make sure that Mozambique was also on your, on your list, uh, Mr. Fry. Very nice to meet you. Back to you, Roberta. Thank you so much, Hugo, for highlighting these very important points and, and the importance of protection mainstreaming exactly that the protection cluster can play. I see uh, uh, Mr. Fry, if you want to come in, because otherwise there is Nishani that also wants to come in. Do you want to reply, share your views, and then we continue with the questions? Maybe I can come in on the, the Southern Africa situation as, as a group. And I, it, it's... Uh, it was the first country I approached to to do a country visit was Mozambique uh, because of uh, because of the, uh, the 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 you know cyclone Edai and 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 I've also approached Madagascar and and what we're seeing is this sort of sequence of drought then severe weather events and and uh, we we've seen that in South Sudan as well where they they suffered a drought and now they're suffering flooding. And you know, we we you are obviously aware of all the impacts that uh, Idai has occurred. You know, I think there are uh, 500 schools were destroyed as a consequence of that, and so there are all sorts of flow-on effects, educational effects, and and so yeah, the issue issue around you know how do we you know uh, create sort of mainstreaming of protection? How do we build? Better resilience is a, a critical issue, and how how do we support that? You know, and and call for better resilience building at at the international level to support these countries will be critical. So uh, yes, I, it's certainly on my radar screen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fry. Nishani, you wants to come in? You want to come in? Hi. Hi, my name is Nishani. I'm uh, with uh, an NGO, humanitarian NGO network called ICWA, and we've got members all over the world uh, in over 160 countries and working in conflict context, complex emergency context. And I think my reflection is I agree with a lot of the uh, the comments ca coming from all the colleagues of, of the complexities that we need to we have to work with and in the humanitarian sector what I see working with our NGO colleagues especially we have not been very much looking at the rights approach uh, the issues of climate change in 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 that light uh, if you could say it of course we are responding to to uh, communities who are most vulnerable in conflict complex emergency context and fragile context where other organizations are not there. And I think that is the kind of the link that I, I see very much for the humanitarian community, especially NGOs who are there where no other communities or human rights NGOs and organizations are not able to access populations, especially most vulnerable and in need. And I think there's a, a real requirement to raise awareness among humanitarian NGOs and colleagues of the linkages between rights-based approaches and the protection issues and humanitarian context and how we're responding. And this is something that we as ICWA is trying to do a little bit more and better, but it is, it's not always easy uh, when there's the humanitarian principles involved and there's attentions that we face. But I think what we we need to really raise the bar in 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 how we respond and how we're preparing not only uh, communities but also ourselves to be now responding to impact. So the whole conversation on loss and damage that we're not involved in as humanitarians, we we are responding to emergencies, but we're not, you know, we don't understand what does that loss and damage and, and being part of that whole discourse is because we are not talking the same language and we don't speak the same language. So we are also doing a little bit more awareness on it. And I think this is where my request to on the chat was, is that I think it would be really important to brief 
some of these NGOs who are humanitarian, especially the ones who are working in these really areas where no one else is accessing them, to, to kind of raise awareness more on how can we engage, how can we engage in these mechanisms better, how can we provide more input and also take that back to the field, take back that back to communities that we're working with to also raise awareness among them, what are their rights, responsibilities, and how can they also engage in these uh, processes. So uh, I have shared already the Bangladesh uh, request. Unfortunately, it's tomorrow is the deadline, so I'm not sure how many humanitarian NGOs are going to respond to that. Um, but it would be great to connect beforehand also, before your visit, so that we can connect you with our uh, humanitarian NGO network that's already there. We have a very vibrant community active on the ground. Uh, we have an NGO for our, uh, that we support uh, as ICWA to, to kind of build their strength, to do advocacy on various topics and themes. And of course, climate change and protection and displacement, of course, is one of them. Oh, thanks. Thank you so much, Anishani, uh, for this very insightful uh, um, uh, inputs that you provided and the importance also, as you were saying, to, to raise the bar and for protection actors uh, to do more and, and to look more at the human rights consequences um, of climate change. I don't see any other hand raised and let me see the chat. Is anyone else who wants to come in? Uh, there is a question in the chat from Vera. Um, will the Special Rapporteur also focus on specific human rights impacted by climate change and particularly interest in the statelessness, rights to nation, right to nationality and climate change? Will the Special Rapporteur also do thematic reports to cover these kinds of aspects? I think the Special Rapporteur already replied. Uh, I mean, I'd like, I, I will let you speak, uh, Mr. Fry. But climate change, uh, you know, is, is a cross-cutting issue which touches upon so many different human rights. So I'm not sure in the in 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 your mandate you will have the time and the capacity to address all the human rights issues. But you can you can reply to this question. You have already presented your your thematic priorities. But please, you can tell us more if you want to touch upon different human rights uh, during your the tenure of your mandate. Well, thank you. Just uh, quickly to say thank you very much, Nishani. And I think you've made a very strong point about, you know, the, the, there may be, you know, need to Im improve the sort of communication with the humanitarian cluster, I think is, is critical uh, to understand the, the sort of rights based aspects of, of humanitarian responses and make that connection. And I, I think that's an important area. And, but, and to, to respond to Vera, Obviously, you know, rights around nationality and uh, are critical, and this is part of the issue I want to look at. You know, as uh, as uh, you know, are, are people being displaced? Are there consequences for for nationality uh, and 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 jurisdiction areas? Uh, you know, I I read some uh, some recent papers where flooding has has uh, affected people in their their identity papers have been washed away. They've lost everything, including their identity papers, so that they, they become non-persons, I guess, uh, legally. So th these these are sort of the issues that I'd certainly want to look at. You know, what what are the what are the measures that can can be brought in to to give uh, you know identity to people who may may have lost that as a consequence of uh, climate change impacts. Thank you, Mr. Fry. Um, um, they uh, they're also asking, like Mariana and uh, and Nishani also ask to share a call for inputs. The call for inputs that you will issue for the upcoming reports and country visits, and I and I can ensure that uh, the human rights engagement task team will share all call for inputs with the task team members. And if there are other partners who would like to join the task team, you are more than welcome to write to us. Uh, perhaps, uh, Mr. Fry, just uh, just a question: Are you planning to organize consultations with civil society? Because we spoke a lot about the importance of involving affected communities and also those grassroots organizations that are working closely with affected communities. So I'm wondering if you're planning uh, to organize con regional consultations or consultation at the country level uh, to hear more about the consequences, or the human rights consequences of climate change on the ground. 
Yes, thank you. Well, certainly within my country visits, I, uh, you know, as I've made that sort of call for for uh, submissions, particularly on the visit to Bangladesh, but I'm I'm exploring, uh, you know, other forms of consultation as well. So I I was uh, a couple of weeks ago the the um, Franciscans International organised uh, a online hookup with uh, people in in uh, in in Africa, and then there was a, a set, another one for people in Asia uh, around looking at my mandate and those sorts of discussions. So I'm I'm trying to you know have those as regularly as possible, so that you know people from the ground can engage with me and and have those sorts of discussions. So uh, I'm I'll, I'll certainly be reaching out, and so if you've got any contacts uh, that would be useful, you know, please let me know. Thank you so much, Mr. Fry. There is Sabrina from uh, Mali Protection Cluster who would like to come in. Sabrina, please come in. Yeah, maybe one point that I didn't hear, but that is uh, quite relevant for us as humanitarian is um, how we we put it in the agenda of our discussions with the donors, because I think it's also something quite critical. So if we look at, for example, in Mali, what we see is that in general, uh, we don't have like a real flexibility um, um, with, the, with the program that I implemented. So I think um, in a context where we have like um, um, natural disasters and when we need to to shift from one location to another, it can be also quite critical to to ensure that uh, this aspect of um, uh, climate change and the impact that that we can have on social cohesion with the host community, etc., um, is uh, is clearly also um, um, taken into account. I think it will be good, like, to have like as a standard point uh, in our advocacy with the donors, because in general, um, when we discuss about uh, climate change, it's more like, oh, we need to imp uh, to implement a project that is uh, clearly focusing on um, um, on this aspect. But in what we need is like to have it like more uh, as um, a bit um, uh, mainstreamed in um, in all our activities. Thanks. Mr. Fry, do you want to reply? Do you have any suggestion on how we could better mainstream um, climate change in our donor requests, especially for, for humanitarian actors on the ground? Yes, I, I mean, this is a, cha a challenge, uh, you know, of, of getting sort of uh, broad approaches to, to, to fit all the connections around this. I, I have, you know, in my past life, had problems with the, the issue of mainstreaming because because donors like to use that term to sort of uh, to to sit to to repackage existing uh, development assistance and put a little tag on it being climate change. So and 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 within that sort of mainstreaming, it's easy to do. the The issue is is are we looking at we have to find new and additional finance over and above. Uh, development assistance that that comes, uh, you know, generally um, to cover the climate change issue, and that's 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 the critical issue. Is you know, uh, should we be looking at a whole lot of new finance, uh, you know, for countries that are affected by climate change, over and above their ODA, and just rebadging their existing allocation to cover climate change issues because that certainly won't be enough so we we really have to push the donor community towards this principle of you know polluter pays and of course that that's going to be a real challenge thank you mr fry there is isabel who wants to come in isabel please Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Isabel Michel and I'm working uh, with UNHCR um, as a protection officer. Um, thanks a lot for the briefing and for the um, uh, experience sh shared by, by colleagues and, and partners. I just wanted to highlight that 
um, UNHCR has engaged indeed with um, uh, OHCHR. We recently had a, a, a webinar on this subject uh, with the GPC um, Human Rights Engagement, Engagement Team, also together with the Special Rapporteur of, on the Right of IDPs. Uh, we've also um, engaged with uh, the Special Rapporteur on, 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 human, um, on Violence Against Women on Climate Change. Um, there's a lot uh, of things that I would like to, to highlight, but uh, maybe uh, I will focus on, on um, uh, uh, two points, three points. Um, maybe wanted to um, highlight the need to strengthen the capacities of uh, everybody, including ourselves. We are learning uh, every day in this uh, field. Things are evolving a lot and, and, and very uh, quickly and getting um, together with partners and yourselves and people on the ground is really a long-term process um, and getting up to, to pace uh, as regards uh, new publications, uh, uh, research reports from the IPCC, um, new findings. Uh, um, that's uh, really um, a long-term effort and we are, we are really engaged uh, and, and please um, partners, if you have any need for support, never hesitate to, to, to raise it to us. We're, we're always there. Um, another point, litigation is uh, an aspect that you highlighted, Mr. Frey, in your, in your uh, statement. We're very um, pleased to hear that um, case law is really um, still a few years ago, uh, was quite limited. We see that it's really expanding and uh, uh, we have um, increasingly targeted uh, cases that we are looking at. Um, uh, we, we engaged a lot with uh, colleagues working on uh, refugee status determination or, or working on country of origin information on um, how to put light on, yes, indeed, the impacts of climate change on, on specific countries or areas, but really specifically highlighting the link between these impacts and vulnerabilities of specific groups or communities and how they are being um, differently uh, affected. Uh, this is very key for us to be able to provide protection. We are engaged a lot on, um, on research and trying to um, build uh, evidence um, on this link. And the third point I'd like to highlight is research. Uh, this is really a priority for UNHCR in this field. We are engaged with uh, colleagues in the regional um, uh, bureaus and in, in all regions of the world and, and countries to really uh, get the information from the field, but uh, to link it with our reflection uh, and uh, to provide further uh, guidance on um, how to fully apply existing instruments. We would be very, very pleased to continue this discussion uh, with a special reporter and all partners here and that's um, a, a burning issue and uh, we are really um, all together to to work on this thanks a lot thank you so much isabel um mr fry do you have some uh final remarks uh, there is isaiah isaiah please come in and then we can go to we are running out of time so we can go to the conclusion please isaiah Thank you very much for, for giving me the floor. And thank you, Mr. Fry, for, for your time. I, I have a couple of remarks, and one of them is related to the great sense of ownership we have as NGOs for your mandate. I work for Lutheran World Federation, which is an NGO that is both active in the climate change debate, but also a humanitarian actor in its own uh, respect. And I think, um, as, as as you know, this your mandate was one that we advocated for for quite a number of years. And we're so glad that that it's it's on, and we're so glad that you're you're on it. One reflection that I have is related to um, what I would say that the, the missing um, link within the UNFCCC conversation. Uh, to human rights. I think over the years, there's been a weakening of language related to human rights within uh, the conference of the parties, within the negotiations. I, I even dare say that there was 
almost like a systematic attempt to completely remove and purge um, climate action, uh, human rights from climate action. And I think it would be interesting to hear from your perspective, uh, knowing you well and knowing the work that you've done within the UN of Triple C, if if you think there will be an opportunity to to once again um, activate or um, create some momentum for human rights conversation within uh, the context of implementation of the Paris Agreement, but also within uh, the Framework Convention. And then the last question um, is related to what I consider as the biggest threat to human rights. And I think this is the, 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 the contradiction between climate crisis, as it were, and also the ambition that governments have in place to respond to it. I think if we look at the IPCC reports, including the recent one, and look at the trends in which climate action is being implemented, be it addressing loss and damage or providing fin uh, climate finances or mitigation, it all falls short um, of, of what is required. And I wonder whether within your mandate you've got um, either within part of your priorities or your uh, action as you engage within this mandate, the concept of revisiting climate action and ambition as a way of protecting human rights. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Isaiah. Uh, Mr. Fry, please, over to you. Muted, you're muted. Yes, thank you. Sorry. I, I, I yeah, the no, right. I just wanted to. Yes. Yeah, I just said over so, to you, Mr. Fry. Th thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Uh, I'm very much looking forward to collaboration. Uh, there's only one of me as special rapporteur. And so, uh, I, you know, I have to find the sort of really strategic measures uh, to, to advance the mandate. And I, I, I sort of picking up on that and what Isaiah was saying, he's absolutely right. I think I think there has been a sort of diminishing or, or missing link between human rights and, and the climate change agenda. Uh, certainly when I was working for the Tuvalu government, I was part of a group called Friends of Human Rights and Climate Change. And it, it was a struggle to get you know, human rights, we, we we got it into the Paris Agreement, but only in the preamble. So, you know, it, it's not strongly there. And I it, it'll certainly be part of my work to, to make that connection because of my background in, in the climate change negotiations to elevate the issue of human rights. And, and you know, just to try and find where where we can make those links strongly. And so, in, in and that's, one of the issues that I'll be picking up in my report to the General Assembly in October. And, and uh, you know, specifically the timing of that is before the next COP. So to draw attention to the issue of, you know, the, the issue of lack of mitigation action uh, leads to human rights impacts. So that's one key message. And, and the other key message is the lack of action to, to address loss and damage is is you know a humanitarian crisis that's uh, confronting us all. So the, these are sort of two key messages that certainly I'll be bringing to the COP and and you know seek support of civil society in in supporting those measures. And I guess the final word is I, I want to thank everybody for their for their contributions. It's been a very very useful discussion. Uh, you know, to hear the, the the situation on the ground, the complexities that people are confronted with, uh, you know, to define what is climate change and what are other impacts, the connections between that, uh, you know, climate change impacts, human rights impacts against women, children, and and the connections with security issues are, are critical. So I'm extremely grateful for this uh, this dialogue, and hopefully we can have more. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Fry. And indeed, as you mentioned, um, it's also very difficult from our side to summarize uh, such a rich discussion. We discussed about the human rights consequences of climate change and communities, internal displacement and displacement across borders, which is leaving displaced communities in a sort of legal vacuum where they are not considered refugees according to international refugee law. We discussed it about negative coping mechanisms and the stronger impact of climate change on women and female-headed households. 
the challenging data collection and how we can make industrialized countries responsible and accountable, the importance of raising awareness with governments, but also with donors, the necessity to extend assistance to host communities to preserve a peaceful cohabitation between displaced communities and host communities. And also we discuss um, extensively about how climate changes are cross-cutting issues, which is, which is touching, touching upon uh, several human rights issues. I think uh, just to connect to what the special rapporteur just said and, and to reconnect to what Andrew was saying at the, at the beginning, uh, we, we need to see the complementarity of our, our mandates. We are, as protection actors and, um, and the special rapporteur and his uh, human rights mechanism, and we need to see how we can better amplify the voices of those who are most affected. And this is where I think protection actors can play a bigger role. When data is available, because we discussed it, that um, th there is a lack of, of data, but when data is available, protection actors, which have such a wider mandate, um, and they have the opportunity to gather so many information, they can channel those information to the special rapporteur who could take action through communications or like to influence the decision of where to go on a country mission or the decision of like what to include in a thematic report. So this is where I see the protection actor can actually complement the work of the special rapporteur and where we can make sure that no one is left behind, that all human rights issues are addressed, even the one that go beyond our mandate, because we as protection and humanitarian actors, of course, we have limited mandate. We have the tendency, as uh, Hugo was saying, to look at um, the immediate operational support. But we, I think climate change is pushing us to, to look beyond uh, operational support and, and how we as humanitarian and human rights actors all together, we can work to build resilience and, and to strengthen the protection of affected communities. So this is uh, where I think protection actors can and have to play a bigger role. And I'm very grateful for the cooperation with the Special Rapporteur, and I'm sure this is just the beginning of cooperation with your mandate. And we remain available to provide support, to share information to our task team members and the wider protection community on upcoming missions, reports. Um, so I, I just end here because uh, it's uh, 3.30 um, Geneva time. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you again, Mr. Fry and Andrew uh, for joining and for the very insightful opening remarks. And we will definitely be keeping in touch. Have a good afternoon, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much.